heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up after staying out of public view for years, Alibaba founder Jack Ma, he speaks out to his own employees, urging them to correct the company's course. We'll have more on the e-commerce giant's plans to compete with rivals like PDD. And we'll hear from Amazon Web Services CEO Adam Zalipsky off the back of the company's reInvent conference, discussing AI, NVIDIA and a lot more. Plus, Apple offers Goldman Sachs an exit ramp for its troubled card partnership. We'll bring you those details so much more throughout the hour. But first, let's check in on these markets. A muted day in terms of overall benchmarks. From the technology perspective, we're still clinging on to gains. We're up a tenth of a percent. More action happening in the bond market and indeed in indices abroad. Let's look at what's happening in China. The Nasdaq Golden Dragon Index really managing to be underwater on the day. I know that Ed probably going to be delving into some of the micro news that is driving that and some of the sentiment shifts when it comes to H1 and the like. We're off by one point and a quarter percent. But the movement is still clear when it comes to the bond market. We're actually seeing what the biggest price increase, yield falls that we've seen since 2020. Everyone wanting to get back into U.S. Treasuries as they anticipate that the Federal Reserve will be cooling down its hike or indeed might well be even cutting as soon as May next year. That's where some of the pricing action seems to be showing off by seven basis points on the front end of the curve. Let's look at what's happening in the world of crypto because the dollar has actually been, well, maybe a little bit of a strength today after such weakening, but we're currently off by some six-tenths percent on Bitcoin at the moment. We're still trading, though, at that elevated $37,000 level. Ed, what have you got on the micro? Look, there's still a lot of news coming out of China's technology sector. The surprise move for Jack Ma, who's not been operationally involved at Alibaba since around 2020, putting out this internal memo saying they need to correct the course. These are the US listed shares of Alibaba down 2.6%. But what was interesting is him praising rival Pinduoduo. And we're going to have team coverage of this story later in the show. It isn't straightforward, but it is a surprise move. And it is moving markets, at least on the US listed shares, as you can see. Another big story that we're going to discuss is Apple and Bloomberg reporting via a Bloomberg source that they've issued this term sheet to Goldman Sachs saying we have a way to unwind the relationship on the credit card and the savings account. Again, it is not straightforward. We're going to get the Silicon Valley take from Mark Gurman and the Wall Street take from Shanali Basak later in the program. Amazon down four tenths of one percent. I just flagged that because we will hear from AWS CEO Adam Zlipsky on a chatbot. It's called Q. I'll tell you why later in the show. But it hasn't really done anything to move the needle on the shares, despite all of the announcements that they put out yesterday afternoon. Yeah, so many announcements, thick and fast, whether it's working with NVIDIA or indeed as its own chips internally. But before that, let's just go to what this macro picture looks like. We're just looking through the bond market. We're looking at the impact on the tech sector more broadly. Alessio Delonges is with us. He's senior portfolio manager over at Invesco. And, well, Alessio... The amount of run-up that we've seen in tech stocks has been phenomenal for November, and we know how much it's led the benchmarks. Is this going to continue from your perspective? Thank you, Karen and Ed, for having me. Uh, we think, actually, the, uh, the, the global yield backdrop that you just highlighted um, is likely to, um, to stimulate a cyclical rebound into year-end and into next year. Um, as you alluded to, tech has been driven primarily by, obviously, a thematic uh, uh, focused um, uh, artificial intelligence narrative and also supported by the declining global bond yields uh, as of late. But what we think is really happening is that this declining bond yield will lead a cyclical rebound because it's primarily driven by a fall in inflation expectations and actual inflation, which will, in our mind, uh, create a more supportive narrative for a soft landing and therefore allow uh, market participants to believe again in a cyclical rebound in the cyclical sector. So we do think tech has outperformed because of its quality characteristics, its defensive characteristics, its higher duration characteristics. But now we do expect a rotation more to the sectors and styles that have been neglected and unloved, such as smaller capitalizations and uh, value-oriented sectors. Is banks one of those? We're just looking at a banner at the moment, the FDIC coming out with its annual report and actually talking about how profit, profits, bank profits are dipping as they say ultimately that loans are the next pain point at the moment that they're seeing. And, and most notably, they're saying the banking industry on this quarterly focus has got some unrealized losses that are increasing in the third quarter. So is it now the time to be getting into banks? 
I think you're alluding to a very important point. We have now just dealt for over a year of yield curve inversion, which we know uh, creates a particularly challenging environment for financials. The yield curve is beginning to re-steepen. And um, if we do see uh, uh, rate cuts into next year, um, a powerful re-steepening of the yield curve would uh, improve materially the forward perspective on, on, on bank profits. So we do place financials and banks as part of that cyclical sector that is likely to benefit together with others uh, if um, our thesis of a cyclical rebound and re-steepening of the yield curve does play out. Alessio, you take this kind of world view from a capital allocation standpoint, right? You are kind of more heavily weighted toward equities. But the world of technology is big. We just talked about China. We're increasingly talking about Europe. How do you guys feel about tech in the United States vis-a-vis -vis Europe and parts of Asia? Well, it, it, tech, the, the clearest expression from a global standpoint of the tech theme or that quality theme that comes with it, large profit margins, large return on assets, it's really a United States theme. When you go outside of the United States, there is more uh, uh, sm smaller capitalizations uh, companies that are likely to benefit more from that cyclical rebound. But it's really, uh, there is a bit of a polarization happening in the structure of capital markets, as you alluded to, where being overweight the United States relative to the rest of the world basically means being overweight tech relative to value, relative to cyclicals. They are two manifestations of the same uh, risk and return profile. Sometimes looking a little deeper tells a slightly different story, right? If you think about the S&P 500 communications or information technology, both up 50% year to date. But a lot of that attributable to the Magnificent Seven. You know, think about Microsoft and Apple achieving record highs multiple times this year. How do you feel about that? What does that tell you about the dynamic of this market? It, it's reminiscent of many situations we've seen before where this, the tech sector in particular, is very prone to boost and bust cycles uh, by the very nature of where its return expectations coming from, right? They, these are growth stocks with, that tend to uh, overreact to uh, extrapolation of growth expectations. Um, we have seen a meaningful run-up in the last six months and the decomposition of market returns that you just alluded to clearly does not reflect the performance of the U.S. economy, right? The S&P 500 driven predominantly by the, the disproportionate tech run relative to other sectors is not representative of U.S. economic performance, is representative of the tech sector. The dynamics for the market going forward, uh, we believe that there, there needs to be a rebalancing from those magnificent seven, a rebalancing uh, where there's more participation, uh, wider leadership rather than narrow leadership across uh, sectors and industries that should be more reflective of the outperformance that we do see for the global economy and the recovery that we do see for the U.S. economy. So the positive news is that despite the S&P 500 being up 20 percent year to date, we believe that that is not reflective of a cyclical rebound that we see in the cards. And that cyclical rebound st still has plenty of room to be priced in through a rotation within smaller capitalizations, more cyclical sectors and value-oriented companies within the equity market. Talking about this reorientation, it's interesting, our colleague John Authors was writing about if you still believe in a run-up in in overall technology, but not the Magnificent Seven, the way to play that is equal weighted benchmarks rather than going for those ones that take into account the actual overall market capitalization of these behemoths. Is that something that you're seeing played a little bit more? Is there other ways that you can still remain exposed to technology, but tactically be more along some of the areas that have been beaten up of late? No, I think that's very well said and hits the nail in the head. If you, if you look at equally weighted type of uh, strategies within within uh, tech relative to the market, what they will deliver is a, is a, a, a smaller capitalization bias and a more value orientation. So also when you look at the, the breakdown of large cap growth versus mid cap growth and small cap growth, you can clearly see that smaller capitalization effect. So I think it's it's um, for uh, for a portfolio manager, for a portfolio strategy that, uh, that needs to have and wants to retain a dedicated 
technology exposure, a rebalancing within that strategy towards smaller capitalization uh, and cheaper valuations is the way to, to maintain that exposure and participate to that broadening of the cyclical rebound. Alessio De Longis of Invesco, just a deep, smart take on the technology sector. Thank you. Now, coming up here on Bloomberg Technology, as we've hinted at, Jack Ma speaks out to Alibaba employees to rally them to, quote, correct the course with the company. We're going to have more details on that story next. Caro, what have you got? Let's just talk outside the world of technology for a moment, but it's important to think about what's happening in the world of M&A. And I bring you two insurance behemoths, which might well be combining Humana and Cigna. This is a story coming from the Wall Street Journal saying they're in talks to combine it in a stock and cash deal. You can see the market impact as Cigna currently falls off by more than 5%. Cigna worth more than $83 billion. Humana, of course, about $62 billion thereabouts. From New York, this is Bloomberg Technology. Alibaba founder Jack Ma is actually speaking out to employees at the company in an internal message urging Alibaba to, quote, correct its course. We want to dig into what all of this means. We want to bring in Bloomberg's Henry Wren and Isabel Lee. And Isabel, I start with you because is this a rallying cry? Is this sort of in any way a negative impact? I mean, what does this do to morale when he's bigging up competitors, saying that there's an opportunity in AI? Is he meant to be sort of helping with morale or detracting from it? So this is really interesting, and it shocked a lot of investors, because remember in 2020, Jack Ma largely stepped away from public eye when he criticized Chinese regulators. So many articles were like, where is Jack Ma? And today he makes a comment. And there are three things to look at this, I think. First is um, the fact that he commented, because to your point, I think it meant was meant to encourage troops, but then we have analysts saying that it perhaps may have done the opposite and deflated them because why are you commenting? And the second is where? And he did it in a forum. And he, and the message is also interesting because he praised PDD, his rival, which has, grown, which has grown to be a formidable competitor in recent years. And he said Alibaba needs to course correct. So that's second. Right. And the third is the timing because this comes shortly after PDD again reported blockbuster results. So I am not sure if it actually motivated folks, but. It's really interesting, the fact that he commented, I would think. It, it is a surprise in and of itself that somebody who hasn't been operationally involved since 2020 comments at all and then calls out one of the biggest rivals saying the following about Pinduoduo. Duo. But here's the story as I see it. Bring up the chart and show the performance on the ADRs, at least, of Pinduoduo, Duo, the owner of Timu, versus Alibaba. And the chart speaks for itself, right, Henry? Just explain to the audience, Henry, the battleground between Alibaba and Timu owned by Pinduoduo on the e-commerce side. Yeah, definitely. Just as Isabel said, this comment comes from a very interesting point of time. On one hand, you have the incumbent Alibaba, which is struggling to gain ground in domestic market. It has its strategy changed. It recently canceled a plan to spin off and list its cloud unit. But at the same time, it's going through management reshuffle as well. And at the other side, you have the challenger Timu and its owner Pindodo. So at the domestic market, Pindodo is gaining share rapidly, aggressively by cost cutting and price cutting as well. And at, at the overseas playground, Pindodo is winning share by its Timu super app. And it's planning to, uh, in, to roll out another uh, ads during the Super Bowl um, midtime show as well. So which shows that Pindodo is really gaining ground in the US market in UK and other side of the market as well. So you see that from the two spectrum, you see on one hand, Alibaba is waning, but on the other hand, Pindodo, the PDD, is definitely gaining ground rapidly. Henry, I like that you dig into the restructuring and the on again, off again sort of versions of it. Bloomberg Intelligence put out a piece saying actually this call out by Jack Ma seems to reaffirm that indeed the restructuring is still going to be upon us. What does it end up looking like, Henry? So remember, um, Jack Ma ceded his control as CEO of Alibaba in 2014 and he barely um, entered the public appearance in the last two years due to the tech crackdown. And now he's re-entering the public sphere. He's now commenting in the company's internal messaging board. Um, there are lots of analysis about this and mostly it's about it has been some time um, in this uh, company's history that this company is run by some companies, uh, some, some executives 
executive that doesn't have a close link with Jack Ma himself. But now Jack Ma re-entering this public sphere might mean that Jack Ma might have more control of the company's strategy, more companies' management as well. This is something that we will wait and see. There was a time where Alibaba was going to be China's trillion dollar market cap company. It was going to be China's you know, equivalent of the Silicon Valley darlings, Apple, etc. And a lot has happened this year. You know, there has been leadership shuffles, Isabel. I think it's worth reminding everyone who actually runs Alibaba as it stands. It's exactly right. It's been a tough year for Alibaba, a tough few years, because Alibaba's market cap is now around 190 billion, and PDD has leapfrogged, and it's now around 170 billion. So that's not really a far cry anymore. And of course, we still have 10 cent leading. But the point is, Alibaba was growing at a fast pace, and now it's slowed. And I think. I don't want to put words into Jack Ma's mouth, of course, but I, it definitely shows that he's kind of really concerned about the direction of where Alibaba is going because it's one thing to slow, but another thing for all your rivals to surpass you. So I think that's really key right now. And, you know, Ma even this month hit the brakes on his plan to reduce his stake on Alibaba because the stock price was not allowed at a level that he's happy with. For now, Alibaba is just a fraction of what it was in 2020 and is trading at the lowest level this year, Ed. Yeah, and it's in Negi Terry year to date, while Pindodo's up triple digits year to date. Bloomberg's Henry Wren and Isabel Lee, great team coverage on a, an important China story. Meanwhile, sticking with China, China's 5Y Capital, an early backer of Xiaomi, is on track to surpass its target of raising $700 million for a closely watched venture fund. It's a sign that investors are regaining confidence in the world's biggest internet arena. The oversubscribed U.S. dollar fund has a hard cap of $800 million and is set to close early next year. That, according to Bloomberg sources. Cara. Now, let's just move our attention towards the world of crypto for a moment, Ed, because Binance has appointed a new CEO after its $4.3 billion settlement with the U.S. Department of Justice that forced the co-founder, CZ, to step down. Now, Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix sat down with Richard Tang earlier to discuss his vision for the company as the new CEO. The U.S. resolution with the U.S. agencies are very important, right? Uh, there are historical issues on compliance, registration and sanctions, and we've the resolution, we move on to a new chapter, moving past a very challenging period of our corporate history. So going forward, we will continue to focus on things like user growth. On that front, I need to stress that user assets are back one-to-one. -one. Users can withdraw 100% of their assets at any point in time. We will continue to focus on user need. At the same time, we did make mas uh, some mistakes along the way. We acknowledge those. It's important for us as a financial institution to do so, and we learn from those, and we continue to build in that journey, right? On things like, I think you're going to ask, where's our headquarters? We'll make those yeah. disclosures in due course, right? Um, as part of the resolution, there are certain things that we will put in place uh, that we have agreed to do so, including board of directors, but those announcements will be coming soon, so watch that space. Yeah, but Richard, can you already just give us a sense of what people want? So if they want, you know, a more normal structure with a headquarters that was problematic in the past because there was no one single place, how fast do you think that will be done? And then I'll also ask you about the board of directors, because I guess that's what people are asking for. It's like, what kind of framework will Binance have? Well, compared to the past, where the industry is very nascent, if you look at today, the direction of travel is very clear. There's going to be much more regulations for the crypto industry, even though only one third of global regulators are regulating this space. But the direction of travel is very, very clear, right? So along with that, along with the maturing of both the industry as well as the corporate ourselves, all these things will be put in place. As I mentioned again, the board of directors will be instituted based on very robust timeline. Uh, same for mm -hmm. things like uh, the question you, that you asked. And we'll make those announcements because we can't disclose that at this point in time. It's today's Big Take, and we're taking a look at an issue that's been rising along with AI-generated content coming closer and closer to real images. We bring you exclusive reporting from Bloomberg Business Week, focusing on a group of deep fake pornography victims and how they actually banded together. They fought back despite the absence of federal laws to protect them. Bloomberg's Olivia Carvel joins us now, one of the key reporters on this. And 
it all goes back to New Year's Eve 2020 when a text came through to one of these particular women in Long Island who've managed to now, well, find, feel they were perhaps victims and fought back and ended up sort of winning out here. Yeah, that's right. I mean, this is a story of female empowerment in this new era of generative AI that we all live in. This technology is both terrifying but also exciting. And I think we wanted with this story to highlight some of those potential harms. And that's what led us to Levittown, Long Island. Olivia, in all good big takes, there is a case study or case studies and a narrative around the broader story. But what it highlights is a lack of legal protection, a deficit in the law. Just explain that side to us. When you look across the country, there is just a patchwork of laws focusing on deep fakes at the moment. The story is really symbolic of the fact that there are no very strong laws to target deep fake content. Right now in the US, there is no federal law against creating fake pornographic content online. And with this rise of generative AI, that puts us in a very scary place. So what we did for this story is we analysed some of the statutes that have been put in place across the country and found this patchwork of civil cases, some, some of the statutes are criminal, some only target election-related content, and some are just amendments to revenge porn laws. What this means is that there is very little recourse for victims of deepfake pornography today. It's an extremely graphic internet address, which was where they found the content that was faked but seemingly of themselves, young girls in school. And I'm interested as also, you also go to New Zealand for the story and a legal entanglement that's happening over there. Is this an issue in the US alone or is this a global issue of regulation trying to keep up with now generative AI pushing out what are incredibly realistic photos that aren't photos? This is definitely a global issue. We're seeing cases across the country. As we were studying this particular website, we saw examples of deep fake pornography of women from countries all over the world. This isn't just a US problem, but this case in Levittown is the first real example of a deep fake related conviction, where we could highlight in the story how prosecutors and the police really tried to file charges against the young man who was behind this content, but ultimately failed to do so because there are no laws to protect victims of deep fake pornography here. So I feel as though this story, this narrative, and you're right, it crosses from Levittown all the way to New Zealand, is symbolic of a much broader problem. Bloomberg's Olivia Carvel with The Big Take. Terrific reporting. Thank you. Another big story coming up. Apple reportedly taking steps to pull the plug on a credit card partnership with Goldman. The details next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. Ed Ludlow here in San Francisco. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. Let's get a check in on these markets because really it's the macro picture that drives what's happening in the benchmarks and the bond markets at the moment. We, of course, get GDP that looks strong. We have the, the inflationary pressure from the PCE, that well-liked number that the Federal Reserve analyzes, just showing that cooling down in price appreciation. And most notably, the fact that the Federal Reserve is still seeing a lot of its speakers out there talking about how inflation just looks like it can be under control at the moment, the policy where it stands. NASDAQ currently up some quarter of a percent. The big moves are happening in the bond market once again. So we see that yield pulling down on the two-year, on the 10-year, across the curve, really. Looking at Bitcoin, though, on the downside versus, well, a US dollar that we've actually seen slightly rebounding on the day. So maybe that's the driver of choice today. And crypto, we're down by six-tenths of a percent. Moving on to some of the individual names and the macro perspe micro perspective, though, because I'm looking at what's happening in the world of Golden Dragon China Index, the Nasdaq Golden Dragon. This is what, of course, is the Chinese names traded here over the United States, ADRs. And actually, under pressure after we saw, well, Meituan's numbers, showing a lack of resiliency. We're still worried about a Chinese consumer and indeed Alibaba. Jack Ma coming back to speak out and say you need to take on PDD, which actually did incredibly well in its numbers. We're looking at what's happening in HPE as well. It came out with its numbers yesterday after the bell. We're seeing a rebound up some 7%. 7 Why? Well, it's not its server business, that's for sure. It's all about its resiliency in artificial intelligence that manages to buoy this stock. And I'm interested in the AI read across when it comes to Amazon as well, Ed. We're looking at just off by about 4 tenths percent on Amazon, but they have been doing 
well earlier on the day as we saw reinvent, of course, that annual gathering of its customers, really managing to paint a position of, well, combative and comp competitive nature that Amazon's coming at this when it comes with its chips, of course, that it's making and managing to make generative AI part of the corporate lexicon too, Ed. I think combative is is correct competitive is what they'd say amazon web services did kick off its giant annual conference in las vegas yesterday the new announcements updated versions of its in-house silicon an expansion of a partnership with nvidia i caught up with aws ceo adam Salipsky. have a listen well i think our strategy has been very consistent it is to provide uh, choice and powerful uh, options at all layers of the stack so uh, uh, down at the infrastructure layer of, of what you need to, to do, do generative AI uh, really well. Uh, as you mentioned, we uh, both have been investing in our, in our own silicon. And then we, we have had a longstanding, uh, wonderful relationship with NVIDIA. We've been the first to bring pretty much every significant uh, NVIDIA chip to the cloud, uh, including their latest H100 this past summer. And I was really excited to have uh, their CEO, Jensen Huang, on stage with me this morning, talking about uh, an expansion of the partnership with, uh, with AWS, uh, bringing their DGX cloud to, 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 to AWS. And NVIDIA itself is going to be standing up a huge supercomputer of a cloud for their own internal R&D on AWS. So it's a, a fantastic expansion of what's really a, a great relationship that benefits our mutual customers. Adam, are there still supply constraints around NVIDIA GPUs? Well, they're very popular, and I think it is, uh, still remains true that um, uh, there's probably more people who want to get their hands on them than, than actually can, which is one of the reasons why we also announced uh, this concept of, uh, of, of clusters for EC2 uh, for, for, for chips, and so that uh, you can actually go in now and reserve up to hundreds of GPUs for your short-term generative AI needs for things like training models, which can tend to be episodic, and there's really nobody else out there offering anything like that kind of service. Given that's the case, have you had to shift any customers to Trainium because of the limited supply of NVIDIA GPUs? Yeah, it's really not about uh, shifting. It's really about um, customers need different, different customers need different things. The same customer needs different things for, uh, for different use cases. And AWS, for this, over 17 years we've been doing this, has been all about choice, all about democratization, all about putting tools in the hands of our customers so that they can make the choices about what we need. And so uh, we're also excited that we announced the second generation of our uh, training-specific chip for uh, training generative AI workloads, and that is uh, Trainium 2. And that's going to have up to four times the compute performance of the first generation of Tranium. We, of course, have been investing in our own custom silicon for years. Uh, we also today announced that we're shipping the uh, uh, preview of our fourth generation of general purpose chip, Graviton 4. I happen to have one with me right here. This is a Graviton 4 chip. Uh, we're not talking about it. We're not showing slides on it. Uh, it's not future looking like a lot of other cloud providers. Yeah, it is shipping today. And uh, again, our fourth generation. Uh, the power is incredible. The price performance is, is going to be incredibly attractive. And uh, our chips also have incredible uh, energy efficiency benefits, which is really, really important to our cu customers these days. A bit of shade being thrown there, Caro. We also finally got a chat bot from Amazon. It's called Q. Any idea why it's called Q? Please tell me it's something to do with the British Secret Service. It is not, I did post that on X, it is not. Q stands for question. Oh, That's boring. it. That was the rationale from the, the, Star the Trek, boffins inside Bond. Amazon. I know. <laughs> That's so. it. Oh, well, got to love it. Chatbots taking over the world. Meanwhile, well, let's talk about whether or not Apple's focus on fintech has been taking over the world or not, because it's actually taking steps towards winding down its credit card deal with Goldman Sachs. Sources say Apple recently sent a term sheet to, well, perhaps a different institution, which has been trying to ultimately see a pullback from a credit card business for Goldman Sachs at the same time. Let's get more context from Bloomberg News Wall Street reporter Shanali Basak, who also got Bloomberg News chief correspondent Mark Gurman. And Mark, let's start with you on the Apple-Goldman relationship, because, well, it hasn't been as positive as both would have liked, it feels like. Yeah, the Apple and Goldman Sachs relationship has been rocky from the beginning. The Apple Cards development, everything that had to be done on both the Apple side and the Goldman side 
really it was a rocky development process. It was two companies getting into a new game together, right, for the first time. A lot of back-end changes had to be created both at Apple and Goldman Sachs. You had two companies run by people with big personalities, with engineers, with different backgrounds coming together to build something, right? That's what a partnership is. But when you have two really intense companies, two intense groups of people, opinionated groups of people who believe they're doing it best, sometimes that could come to a head. Right? And what you've seen is you've seen pretty good consumer reception uh, to the Apple Card and the other fintech products from Apple over the past few years. But what you've also seen are some struggles, Goldman in particular. This has been a multi-hundred million dollar, uh, if not multi-billion dollar loss in proposition for Goldman Sachs. And so their skin in the game has been little more than a branding exercise. As we've written several times, and I'm sure Shanali can talk about, Goldman has been pulling back from consumer businesses. They've pulled back on other credit cards and such. And Apple needs to sort of save face here. They need to have a strong partner in the credit card game. And being with a company that has been publicly one foot out the door, maybe one and a half feet out the door, maybe even two feet out the door, you know, that really doesn't serve Apple well long term. So what they've done is they sent a proposal to Goldman Sachs to get out of this partnership. This is being able to get out in about two, three years from now versus when the deal is supposed to end in 2029. So I don't know if that means Goldman has to make some sort of public acknowledgement about exiting. I don't know if Goldman has to pay a certain amount. I don't know if Apple has to reduce its payments to Goldman, but they've sent a proposal to Goldman to let Goldman walk about five years early from this partnership while Apple can go ahead and look for someone else to replace them. Sonali, we can get into to Apple's position long term on a card because it looks like the Apple side of the card ain't going anywhere. But there's been an admission from Goldman that they just moved too quickly too early. They made mistakes with the product. Some of the data around the deposits was really good. You know, where are they coming at this from, from Goldman Sachs' side? Yeah, you have to look at it across product lines because I think that's the important part here. On one hand, Goldman likes to pull in deposits. Those market Marcus deposit rates are still quite high. And for a bank, that uh, extra consumer deposit base helps lower the cost of funding for a bank. But the credit card business here, where they have struck deals with GM, major clients, Apple, you have them starting to step back from that business. And it is really kind of the last major piece to the consumer strategy that they're trying to exit from. So what have they already gotten out of? They have looked to sell Green Sky already, United Capital. Uh, these are things that have brought them deeper into the wealth business. They had scrapped that idea of a larger sets of accounts for different clients as well. But uh, the Green Sky was a home installment loan business, of course. So where does that leave them? It leaves them with all these card deals. And Apple is, uh, you know, this, by the way, for Goldman, could have been a problem that could have lasted them years. And when it comes to the Apple card in particular, one may Major problem, Ed, it was the servicing of these clients as well as the loss rates. Because the idea here that Apple wanted more of their clients to be able to get credit through these cards, and so they pushed for that to happen. And now you had Goldman stuck with those loss rates, really bringing down the profitability of the business overall. Now, according to the Wall Street Journal, some of the potential people that could take on these uh, th this card business alongside Apple could include American Express, could include Synchrony. But some of the issues I've outlined for you over there. At Goldman would still hold true for them as well. All right, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman and Shanali Basak. We did show Apple's comment on the story there. They seem committed, Caro, to a card in the first instance and long term. Well, from fintech to where you'd be spending your money, and perhaps it's not at the movies to go and see Wish, it would seem, because Disney's newest animated musical is being marked as a box office dud, delivering just half of its expected ticket sales over the Thanksgiving weekend. Now, Disney Studio executives, they've got to assess what went wrong. Look, it's been a year where we've seen strong female leads win big in the box office. Think Barbie, think Taylor Swift, but Wish? It's flopping, and maybe it's the sign of the times. Maybe these classic fairy tale princess stories aren't as appealing as they were once, or as the mother of a daughter who's obsessed with princesses for my sins. Maybe it's a bit scary, I don't know. But for now, it's a flop. Coming up, we'll take the pulse of the European VC and tech industry. Ox co founder Michael Johnson's joining us on a big raise in the second fund. Ed, well, you got. Yeah, let's get another check on, on what's going on with Signa and Humana. The Wall Street Journal reporting the two are in talks to merge that deal to combine those two very big insurers. I mean, Cigna is an $80 billion company. Humana is a $60 billion company. Could happen by year end, the journal says, citing sources. Bloomberg's not yet confirmed that report, but stocks moving. Cigna down four and a half. Humana down 1.1%. This is Bloomberg Technology.
Stability AI has explored selling the company with management facing increased pressure from investors over its financial position. That all according to Bloomberg sources. A deal is not imminent and the company could, of course, cut the process short without selling. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Rachel Metz, who broke this one. We've been chasing what's going on inside Stability for a little while. Looks like there's a for sale sign in the digital window and Imad is under pressure. What have you learned? Yeah, so we have learned that uh, one of the company's key investors, KOTU, sent a letter to the company in October um, asking, pressure, pressuring Imad to step down, um, asking questions about the company's financial status, um, how much certain people were being paid, things like that. Um, and there's also been, this is putting pressure on, on the company to see if it can find a buyer for itself. It, at this point, doesn't have a ton of cash. So it's been reaching out to a few companies. We've learned it's reached out to Cohere, um, Jasper. Um, uh, those are two of the companies that we know for sure that it's been um, reaching out to. But those companies, as far as we know, are not interested. Meanwhile, spokespeople for the company at Stability fight back and say, no, it's not up for sale. And actually, investors believe in leadership. Do you buy that? I mean, I think these things are always complicated, and it, it, it could be sort of both ways at once, right? They have plenty of investors, uh, but it is certainly clear that some of its key investors are not happy with the direction that the company has been going in, for sure. Rachel Metz, as always, brilliant reporting. We thank you for keeping us up to date with perhaps what's thought of as AI hype. We're going to move away from that for a moment because one firm is going anti-hype but it's continuing to double down investments in the SaaS space. Ox just announced the close of their second fund with $190 million to grow European software startups. Ox co-founder and general partner, Mikhail Johnson, is joining us now. And you have a focus on European software as a service, but can that still be AI leveraged, generative AI applied, if you're saying you're anti-hype at this moment? Good afternoon, Caroline. Yes, very much so. Hmm. I mean, we are not specifically looking to make AI investments as a sector bet per se, but we do think that AI is fund providing a foundational new wave of innovation that will underpin all of software, you know, for the next 10 to 20 years. So very much so, yes. Okay, I've been excited to have you on the show. I think it's like a good time to define again what is SaaS, right? Software as a service. For most people, it just means a piece of software or an app you can use over the internet. And in many cases, that ain't complicated. So is that your definition in terms of what you're looking for in a portfolio company? I think there's a couple of things to think about. There's the underlying infrastructure, and then there's the business model. So the infrastructure usually that is associated with SaaS is cloud infrastructure. So you have elastic scalability, and you have multi-tenant hosting. Now, SaaS as a business model can actually work on you know, a lot of different situations as well. And I, you know, it could be a piece of software that sits in a data center, or it could be a shared service, or it could be a true multi-tenant cloud service. I think what is also important for SaaS is that what used to be SaaS was a traditional subscription uh, you know, for a monthly or an annual fee. We're seeing way more sophisticated uh, pricing models, which are either capacity-based or value-based and what have you. So it's evolving continuously. But at the core of it, it's about buying software on a, on a subscription basis rather than buying a perpetual license. You brought back some key LPs, British Patient Capital, Sam Invest, for example. You brought on some new. What is it that they like about European VC investing at the moment? I, we're obviously really happy to raise the fund despite these very challenging backdrop macroeconomically for venture as an asset class and for you know venture back growth companies in general. I think our model is focused on long term creation and avoiding hype cycles, and that has resonated really well with both returning and new investors, specifically as it relates to Europe and you know investing into software in Europe. There's, uh, you know, a, a sort of coming of age where a lot of people are recognizing that the factors that have historically favored perhaps much more U.S. companies are, you know, not as important today when it comes to the availability of talent, when it comes to the availability of actually dealing with distribution, and in terms of how to thinking about scaling commercially, even if you start out in Europe with an ambition to have a globally leading company. Ox co-founder, general partner, Mikhail Johnson, thank you so much for joining us on the show. 
here on Bloomberg Technology. And coming up here, we'll have more on the outlook for tech investing with Nicolo De Masi, chairman of the Futurum Group. Uh, there's been some news while we've been on air. NVIDIA's CEO, Jensen Huang, has been speaking at the New York Times Dealbook Conference. He's saying, essentially, it's going to be a really long time until the... U.S. can stand on its own two feet in, in the supply chain for chips, saying anywhere from a decade to two decades for supply chain independence. The stock up nine-tenths of one percent during his comments. This is Bloomberg Technology. The great thing about this technology, which it's hard to believe, is just coming on to the year anniversary. It seems like it's been here much longer and the pace has been incredible, yeah. is the fact that you can actually put it in the hands of business people. And I think that, above all else, has really unlocked the ability for people to really like imagine what, how this can be used in their businesses. A little bit earlier, I was on stage with J.P. Morgan, Chief Data and Analytics Officer, Teresa Heitzenreather. And we want to discuss a little bit more about how AI is actually bringing in money, boosting revenue, being commercially viable at the moment within not just finance, but across the board. Niccolo De Masi is chairman of the Futurum Group, and you sit on a number of boards. You were once named a SPAC king. We'll deal delve into that in a moment. But I'm interested at the moment with IonQ, for example, quantum computing company. How are you seeing the commercialization opportunities of generative AI within the companies that you help, well, oversee? Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's coming faster and it's closer than everyone thought when you're talking about quantum machine learning uh, and quantum computing you know, intersecting with artificial intelligence and machine vision. Um, you know, you're seeing it across, frankly, every sector, right? From drug discovery to making next generation batteries to the gaming industry, um, to even uh, businesses like the Futurum Group that are taking advantage of, of AI across their own market research uh, and advisory. Um, I think quantum advantage is gonna happen sooner than people think, and it's gonna surprise a lot of people. Um, I think you're gonna see uh, quantum supremacy also come earlier than people think uh, and a number of application areas in the next few years. Uh, and I've been excited to watch the, the breadth of my portfolio have an early lead in their respective segments, right? I'm quite proud of the fact that we invested early on every, every board I'm on, every company I'm involved with, and they really are leaders in the respective areas, increasingly partnering with cloud players, Amazon, right. Microsoft, Google, hyperscalers, and a lot of uh, what I see a lot of is the strong partnering with the strong, right? Whether that's NVIDIA with Amazon, INQ with Amazon, Microsoft, Google. And I feel like the strongest companies in AI are actually entrenching their leads right now. Hey, Nicola, real quick, though, lots of emphasis on, on the top line revenue, right? People making money. But the lesson learned has been the compute costs are astronomical. How worried are you about sort of long term anyone actually making any profit from all of the R&D? and the training and inference they're now doing? Well, quantum computing is actually a solution to that, right? In terms of energy usage per, let's call it calculation or, or clock tick, right? If you look at INQs, quantum computers, they're tiny. They don't use a lot of power compared to something that, you know, a national lab is running, right? Um, and so I'm actually quite bullish that by, by 2030, quantum AI through the cloud is gonna change people's perspective on that question you just asked. Um, but at the moment, you're correct. There is a race on that no industry and no company can afford to lose, right? If you're a financial services firm, your prop trading arm is not going to make any money if you don't have the latest quantum computer and the latest AI helping your team. Same in drug discovery, same in you know, defense and aerospace, same in cryptography. Um, and so I think people right now you know, have no choice. And that means the vendor supplier relationships the kinds of companies the future and groups always advising uh, are really front and center right now having to think through where they put their dollars to make sure they max it out, you know, quarter in, quarter out. Short but very sweet. We thank you for your time, Niccolo De Massi, chairman of the Futurum Group. All things focused still on AI, of course. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology, Ed. Check out the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. From San Francisco, New York City, this is Bloomberg Technology.